this morning. Amen. 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 And that concept, October, amen, instead of bringing big people and so forth, we, we are using our own, amen, amen. So these are all original songs that you are hearing for the first time. God richly bless us, amen. amen. Today, we are blessed to receive the ministry of, of, of a very, 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 very special couple in the life of Ghana. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, as you can see, um, the man of God and his wife are even more traditional than all of us put together. Hallelujah. Amen. Reverend Dr. Frimpon Manson wrote a book. And the title of the book is Fire from the North. Did you know that Assemblies of God Church, Ghana, is started in the North? Did you know that? Hallelujah. Assemblies of God, Ghana, started from the North. Amen. And the parents, the parents of the man and God and the woman of God here are those who started the church. Can we put a hand on to God? Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah. They are part of the missionaries that were sent to start a service of God from the north. Both of them, actually, uh, the wife, what's her name? Uh, Sue. Amona Sue. Amona Sue. Amona Sue. Amen. She, she, she claims she was made in Ghana and born in the U.S. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and John was born in Ghana. Hallelujah. And they've grown up, and as we speak, their children are missionaries in Ghana. Hallelujah. Amen. So we thank God. We're receiving the ministry of the most reverend John T. Godwin, presiding Archbishop and Patriot of the International Communion of Orthodox Episcopal Charismatic Churches and Missionary Society of St. Francis of Assisi, Apostolic Emissary and President of Life Care Ministries International. Here with his wife, Amonesu, amen, authentic Ghanaians, hallelujah. Amen. In fact, uh, we have an appointment with the ambassador of Ghana to go and eat Jehu. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so with a clap offering unto God, may we receive our own, amen, into our midst. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Reverend, the most reverend, John Godwin. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you today. Always good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Mustafa Mami. Thank you. It's always good to be with you. They are very dear friends. and We're so happy to be here. You may be seated. My wife is coming for a moment. And uh, he's going to greet you. And uh, we are just happy to be here. We've been trying 
to work something out for a long time. And COVID and other things have come along the way, but we're finally here. So we're happy to be here and to be with you. My wife, Amonosu, uh, her parents were living in Walewale in northern Ghana when, uh, when her mother became pregnant with her. And her name is a Kasana name from the uh, Upper East. So her name, Amonosu, means she laughs until she's satisfied. And she's also Ama. But uh, <laughs> we are so, we, we, we are happy to be with you today, and to be able to share with you and uh, share the goodness of God. Now, her parents arrived in Ghana in 1947, 47, and uh, were there for many, many years, including her grandparents were there for a period of time. So our grandchildren in, the, in Ghana now are the fifth generation of her family to live there. And... Uh, my parents arrived in Ghana in 1937, so February. That's 19, Kojo Oo. So February this year was 85 years that my family has been in Ghana. So we're just we we're always happy to be with our fellow Ghanaians and to be able to share with you. I want my wife to greet you and. Uh, to share with you briefly before we come. My tree is just kakra kakra. We bless you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's so wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, whether it's here or Ghana, that we have the freedom to come before our heavenly Father, the King of all the universe, because of what Jesus did. Bless his name. Bless his name. We do thank you so much for having us. Your precious pastors have been so wonderful to us, and now it's wonderful to get to meet the rest of the family. Um, I'll do just one short, uh, a, a northern song, because usually wherever I go in Ghanaian churches here in the U.S., they uh, they like to hear songs from the north. No, I don't, uh, so far, I don't need the piano, and uh, because th these are old traditional ones. <laughs> these are not the westernized Oh, okay, the, brum, the, the drummer, yes, I can use it. <laughs> okay, this one, Dolio Kalan and Moyada, follow him and believe in him because our sins is what sent him to the cross. And the glory that Jesus did not receive here on earth, he went back to the heavens and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Dolio Kalan and Moyada. Si tumbiere in da chaco cana dunia monti qui tilegi dunia ama gilama shele on quang dunia mo ti duma yi salan la bo bebu she ntilan zak mo gilama dolio there's a lot more verses but i'll stop our time is short <laughs> okay okay uh all my life growing up whenever we were uh back in the us uh, we, my parents, and both of our parents had to come back every fourth year to raise our funds again uh, to go back to Ghana. So every church we went into, my dad always taught the congregation a Ghanaian song. Now, you younger ones may not know this, but did you know that O Nyami Ye originated in Ghana, the what God is so good. All the Obruni churches here sing God is so good, and they don't know the history that it came from Ghana and was translated into English, 
and brought to the States a long time ago. Um, I remember even <laughs> as a little girl in Tomale, I, I, you know, you don't have a lot of memories from when you're four years old, but I remember this uh, because I grew up speaking Dagbani. I learned it when I learned English, when I learned to talk. So tree, I, I didn't know, but I knew that song, and I said, well, Daddy, why do they sing Onyami Ye Mommy and not just Onyami Ye Daddy? <laughs> so we always taught that to Obrunis. Now, I'm going to teach you Kambongsi, that means you Southerners, a song in Dagbani that you already know the English part of it. Uh, it's, uh, there is power, power, wonder, working power. Okay, you already know that one. So, uh, because the o nyami ye was only five words, o nyami ye ma mi, that was easy for people to learn. So the same, this, in Dagbani, the song There is Power only has five words. It's yisa, because that's Jesus, jim, blood, mala, has, yiko, power, much. Uh, so I'll sing it through once, and then it's easy. So then you have to learn a northern song. Okay. Come on now. Now it's your turn. Yisa jim jim mala yiko pam yisa jim alleluia yisa jim oziana yisa jim jim mala yiko pam yisa jim mala yiko Amen. We could stand here for several hours telling you our stories of being raised in Ghana and how the Lord has used our families. My husband didn't mention, maybe he'll tell you later, his senior brother was nine months old when they first came to Ghana in 37. His two senior sisters were born, one was born in 1939 in Agogo Presby Hospital, by Kumasi, and the next one was born 1945 in Korlebu. So then his senior brother came back after Bible college and married and pastoring, and they had a three-year-old daughter. They came back to Ghana in 1962. He was there six weeks. They went further north to the little village of Tili to have a Christmas to New Year's convention and the first night my brother-in-law had a small portable generator on the tailgate of his Chevy pickup to provide lights you know Zana mats and just wood on cement blocks he went out to get something from inside the pickup truck and God only knows the generator exploded burned him head to toe he lived one week. They took, rushed him to Boku Hospital. He died there and is buried on the compound where he grew up as a little boy. My father-in-law built the house there in 1938, so Sidney grew up there. And he left his widow, his young widow who had been in Ghana six weeks, and their daughter. But she continued on as a missionary. Everyone here has a story, it's not the same as that one, but everyone here has a story of what God has brought you through to this day. Miracles of what God has brought you through to this day. So it's not just looking at us, oh, we're all Brunies and we lived in the north. That was home to us. You have been through struggles to get here, struggles living here in this place that is not heaven, even though everyone back home thinks it is. But we give our praise to the Lord for where you are today. So stand with me and just sing before I hand it to my husband the song that we all know that we must praise him for. Yebeto Ebenezer, Nyame Nadumarakwa.
Father, we praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for what has gone before and for what is coming to pass. We give you thanks for your word that will come. We pray that your word will cause our hearts to be stirred with a passion for you. We thank you for these things, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to quickly mention two things to you. We have not been staying at home the last few days, so um, we didn't get here with the uh, PowerPoint we often use and uh, other things that we would, would share with you, but um, I want to mention to you that if you would like to be on our mailing list, email list, you could sign this and we will add you to that list. So I'm just going to leave this here. If anybody wants to be on that list, you just give me your email list and an address in a way I can read it, and we'll make sure you're there. If you're curious about what we do, uh, our website is Life Care Ministries International. All spelled out, Life Care Ministries International, the whole thing, dot com. Life Care Ministries International dot com. And that will tell you something about our history, about the projects we're doing, our current activities in Ghana, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, and so forth. So we just invite you, if you want to see more and know more about what we do, that's there. Today, I want to share from the Word of God and from our own experience with you some things that I believe are important for our lives as we follow the Lord. There's some things that we, we, we can only learn as we walk with God. And It's interesting that uh, the uh, theme that Pastor sent me that you have for the year, um, well, I've forgotten the exact way it's worded. Can you tell me how it's worded exactly? Yes. Only onto the confessions of our faith. And there was another piece, I think, to it, wasn't there? Okay, that's okay. I just found it interesting because we have a conference coming up that we do every year in Ghana, in a shaman, close to Tema. And our theme this year for our conference is that our roots go deep. And I looked at your theme and I said, "Uh uh-huh, you are looking at the same thing. You're looking at pulling the roots deep into God, into who he is. Hebrews 10, there you are. And he is faithful. So, We're talking about the roots going deep. The fact that we have to prepare ourselves and take our roots deep to be able to stand. I used to teach a, there there was uh, something I used to teach 
that I use the theme of sit with God before you can walk with God, before you can stand with God. We haven't learned how to sit with God. We don't know how to walk with God. And if we've not sat with God and learned from him, if we have not walked with him, then we, we come into that battle where things become difficult, when things become so severe, we will not know how to stand firm because we've seen God prove himself already. You have to sit with him before you can walk with him, before you can stand firm with him. So today we're talking and looking in the book of Luke, in the fourth chapter. We will look at that a little bit. But the For us to be rounded in our faith, to be well-rounded, to understand who we are, we need to understand that we, we have a deep understanding of Scripture. We have to go deep into Scripture. We have to have a solid understanding of Scripture. Did you know the Apostle Paul had a solid understanding of Scripture of his day, and he was still persecuting the Christians. He was still killing the Christians. So having a solid understanding of Scripture is not all that we need. We need to have that. But I pass churches every day in Virginia, in Washington, D.C., Every time you turn a corner, you see another church. Maybe it's a church that has now become something else, but there'll be a structure for a church. Their knowledge of the Word of God has not allowed them to survive. But we have to have that. It's necessary. So we need the Scripture. We have to understand the Scripture. We have to understand the preeminence of Scripture, but we also must experience and have an, an, an understanding and a walk with the Spirit. So Scripture is important. Spirit is important. We not only walk with God in our understanding of the Word of God, we walk with Him with our understanding of the Spirit. We have to have our time of coming in sacrament and coming and knowing him and understanding the sacraments that come with our walk because that's a time when we encounter him in the most unique and the most intimate way. But to be more rounded, we also have to serve God. Scripture, spirit, sacrament, and service, we need all. Now, when we're walking with God, and we get excited. We all get excited about, oh, the Scripture tells me that we will do what Jesus did. We see that again and again. The Scripture makes it clear that if we are going to go, we're going to do what Jesus did. We get excited. We're happy about that. But sometimes we haven't stopped to think. All we think about is, oh, we're going to go. And we're going to heal the sick. We're going to raise the dead. We're going to feed the thousands. Yes, we'll do what Jesus did. But what, did us, what else did Jesus do? If we look in this scripture, we have here in Luke, the fourth chapter, we see that there is in the first verse, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. We're walking with Jesus. We're going to do what he did. And then we suddenly find ourselves facing something we are not prepared for.
When I was about 10 years old, maybe, my parents came to the U.S. for a year of fundraising. We were living in an upstairs flat. There were some strangers that came to the house. My father called me and said, John, come here. John, come. I need you to go down to the 7-Eleven. And that's all I needed to hear. I wanted him and I wanted the strangers to know that I was a very obedient son. So I was out the door, down the stairs, down the road, crossed the road, went to the 7-Eleven. And I was standing inside the 7-Eleven before I realized I had no idea why I was there. Not only did I not have a message, I had no power to do anything, no money. You know, when we encounter Christ often, we become so excited about what God has done to transform our lives that we want to go and we want to show that we are just excited and we want to be obedient and do what God has told us to do. <laughs> and we go quickly. And then we discover, oh, we're there, but we don't have the message, and we don't have the power. To have the power means we have to come into those times and survive the difficult times and survive those days of temptation and even those times when we become hungry. It says he was hungry. And even the temptation increased at that point because it says that he said, command the stone to become bread in verse 3. Jesus said, it is written, men shall live by bread alone. Not live by bread alone, I'm sorry. But every word above God. And then in verse 12, Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The enemy will do everything possible to distract, to take us another way, to take our attention off of the thing that he has given us to do. As my wife mentioned, every one of you here has a story as to how you have come to the United States or your family came here. I'm sure most of you are Ghanaian in descent. You may be from other African countries, but you will have a story. And in that story, most of you will give glory to God for the how he changed things and caused things to happen that caused and enabled you to be here. But then we get where we feel God has called us, and before we know it, we are distracted with trying to survive in that place. And in our daily attempt to survive in this godless culture, our daily attempt to send money home to those that helped us come, those that depend on us, we forget what God told us in the first place. My heart breaks as I go through, all through Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., here in, in, in this part of Maryland, as I drive to this or to that situate place, and I see all of the African immigrants that are here, and all of the Middle Eastern immigrants that are here, who are Muslims, who do not know God. They, don't, they know a form of a God, but they don't know our Lord Jehovah. They don't know the grace or mercy of God. And 
I become so overwhelmed with their need. I become so overwhelmed as I pray for them. They've come here for all kinds of reasons. But God has brought them to a country that should have been a country that would have received them and would have loved them and brought them into the kingdom, but instead they are pushed back. I had a Muslim lady just a few days ago. I came out of a Trader Joe's in Fairfax. And she helped me with something. And as she walked away, I was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit as I began to pray for her because I said, God, she is helping an elderly man, but God, those deeds will not get her into heaven. Somehow, Lord, you, I, I am asking you to move on her and give her a hunger for you. And I sat in the car and I wept over her. I see those in our where we live in our townhouse complex where we live who come and go not just Africans but also Asians and many others and my heart is broken because I see they're here where they should be loved into the kingdom and instead they're being pushed back why is it what is God putting into your heart you see, my call is not your call. The love God has given me for certain people is not what he's given you. He's given you something unique, something that is you. There's something that he wants you to do. There's something that he wants you to accomplish. There's a place that he's wanting to take you. There's so much. There's so much that he wants to do. Have any of you here Ever slept under a mosquito net? Anybody, you slept under a mosquito net? Yeah, most of us have. The young ones, no, but most of us have. And you do your best. You do your very best to make sure there's no mosquitoes inside the mosquito net. Is that true? In fact, you, you may even take the mosquito spray and spray it inside there and tuck it all in carefully so that they will all die before you get inside. Sometimes when we do our very best, and we are in there and we're ready to sleep, we find out that one mosquito has not, he's still there. And you hear something right in your ear. Or he's going up your nose. Or, oh, no, no, he's here. And oh, how you will fight that mosquito. Some of us look around and say, oh, who am I to do something for God? What can I do? Look at me. I'm the smallest of the small. I don't have the money. I don't have the education. I don't have the whatever it would take to do that which God has been putting inside you. What can I do? I can't do anything. Who am I? And I look around and I say, How, who am I? What can I do? How much bigger are you than that mosquito that got inside your net? And yet, that tiny mosquito can make you move all around and even jump out of bed if necessary. See, we're never too small. We're never too tiny to do something that will change our community our church, our world, wherever we are. God can use us to make us be like that mosquito that just has an assignment to do something, 
and he's going to do it or else. You have that assignment. God will enable you to do it. God will give you what you need to do that. You see, God helps us as we walk through these things. God enables us as we walk in obedience to do what he's called us to do. The house my father built in 1938 in Boku, in the Upper East region. That house is still standing. In fact, my wife and I have kept us, made, created a small flat in the back of it that, where we keep our things, and when we go there, we, we stay there. So 80-some years later. That house was out on the road by Misiga, very close to the border guard crossing, the Togo and Burkina Faso. That road until recently was always a dirt road. Now, if you know Ghana's geography, you know that's a very dry place. If you look at the map of Ghana, you know in the top northern corner, on the eastern side, on the right side of the map, there's a bump on the top of that map. Okay, Misiga is in the bump, almost on the border. Very dry, very hot. I recall one one uh, Easter Saturday, I woke up. Just oh, this is maybe thirty years ago. I don't know, but I I was sleeping there and I woke up. I was so hot, and I pulled a thermometer down to see. And it was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit at midnight with the, the humidity was less than 10%. It was hot. The daytime was much hotter. And it's dry. And finding water was difficult. Now, when my father built that house, he was a young man, and he dug a well there and was able to reach water. He did that by digging, digging, digging deep, and they couldn't get to the water. Finally, he went to where the British people were doing a gold mine closer to Bolagatanga, and he got some dynamite. My father didn't want anyone to risk their lives, so he himself climbed the ladder down and placed the dynamite in the bottom. And he set it, and then he ran up the ladder, and he told me later he saw that when the dynamite blew up in the well, the ladder went way up in the sky, but there was water. It took something dramatic to get the water. And to this day, the ba- that well still produces water. But it's not sufficient. So then they built a rainwater cistern where they collect the rainwater from the roof. So we would collect the rainwater in that tank. Well, that dirt road, the dust will come The dust will come, and there's no rain for months. That roof becomes dusty, dusty. And that dust collects on that roof. But by the end of the dry season, you are desperate for water. You really need water. and You need to collect enough in that tank to last you until the next rainy season. So you're anxious to fill that tank. But you have to be very careful. If you don't 
allow two or three rains to come and wash that roof, but you connect those gutters to that tank in the beginning, you will collect muddy, muddy, muddy water. And it will cause all that mud to be in the bottom of the tank. And for the next year, you will have muddy water. We have to be wise. We want to be filled, but we want to be wise about who and where we are getting that water and who is teaching and putting that into us. Also, we have to understand that sometimes we think that to be holy, we have to walk through this world and not be contaminated by the world. You know, we're humans. Humans, we're fallen beings. And when you're walking through this earth, you're going to gather dust. If I'm walking in my shoes in the dusty trail in the north, my shoes, no matter how clean and nice they look, will become dusty. Now, if I walk through mud, it takes more effort to clean them. And God has cleaned us already. But if I'm clean before God, and I begin to walk through a place where there's dust and I see things I don't want to see and things happen that we don't want to, we don't have to go through the deep cleaning again. God will come and clean us. We can allow the Spirit to wash us and to wash that away so that now we can produce the fresh water that is needed to feed those around us. So if you, if you make a mistake, you do something, don't become discouraged and say, oh, I'll never make it. I can't do it. I fell again. No. We get back up. We repent. We allow God to cleanse us again. We allow God to clean us again and enable us to do what he wants us to do. The God is in the business of reclaiming those who are passionate and want to know him, those who are reaching out to him. In fact, we need to understand that we serve a God who is a God who comes, a God who comes. All of the other gods, all of the other gods require you to do something and bring something to them before they will do anything for you. You're having a problem, and you go to any of the soothsayers, fetish men, anybody like that. If you don't at least bring a chicken, you will get nowhere. And if your problem is too big for the chicken, you bring something else. If your problem is too big for a goat or a sheep, you bring something else. Many times money will not do. They want blood. The problem can be so big that they will always require that you bring something. But you have to understand about the God we serve. He is a God who comes. He sees us and he comes. He sees where we are. He comes. He comes to where we are. He comes to draw us to him. We see somebody and we say they're a hopeless case. No, the most hopeless case is the one we pray that God will give him a hunger for him because the God we serve is a God who comes to them and he lifts them up. You see, a church that is following God seriously is a church that will take people and lift them from where they are and lift them up, because that's what Jesus does. He lifts them up. He brings them to a new place. I'm going to tell you one more thing before I go. One, one more story. 
one more thing. So my parents, before I was born, so my parents were living in Yendi, in the northern region. They decided that they, with other missionaries, felt they needed to go and establish a mission and began to evangelize the people around Boku in the Upper East. They traveled up there. They got the permits they needed. I don't know if you know that in the colonial period, a missionary could not go anywhere without permission from the British government. The reason the Assemblies of God was only in the, in the northern region and the Upper East is because the colonial government said, that's the only place you can be. So they assigned denominations to certain places. Evangelical Presbyterians to Volta region. Baptist to the Upper East and, and, and Northern region. Catholic to here, etc. So, my parents traveled up in an old mammy lorry, bone shaker. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you don't. But the thing would, that, that truck would travel so fast that my father tied his horse to the back and the horse walked behind them. The, the, the truck could never go faster than the horse. My father rode his horse all over northern Ghana. My father would go out when they lived in Yendi and in Boki. He would, he would leave the house. Sometimes he would be gone a week, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks. Village to village to village, sleeping in the chief's house, washing in the river, eating local food, and telling them about the good news. So they went up there, and he took my mother, my brother. My brother was young. My mother was pregnant with my first sister. And they got to Pusiga, and there was a message from the colonial uh, district commissioner that don't come past there. We've never had white women and children here, and there's some diseases here. We don't want them to come down. So he made them stay. So my father rode his horse down, and he obtained the land in Misiga to build the mission. He finally obtained permission to bring them there when he could finish the building. So he made a tent, and he slept in the tent while he built that house. Then he would go every so many days and ride back and check on my mother and brother, and then come back. The day came when the house was complete, just a mud block house. And he moved them from Pusiga down into that house. And the next day or so, one of the young men, Abba Winnie, came and said, my father asked me to call you to come and speak to him. So my father said, well, okay, who is your father and where is he? He said, well, he's the chief of this area over here. He's about, and he was about three miles away. And he wants to speak to you. So my father rode his horse and went and sat down and asked the chief what it was that he was calling him about. And that old man said, well, he said, several years ago, I was awakened in the night by the Creator God. And he said, the Creator God told me, I have heard your cries for your people, that the truth, they would know the truth, and they would be able to serve the true God. I've heard your cries. 
and there will be a white man that will come, and he will build a house on that hill in Mesiga. He will be riding a horse. And when he builds that house on the hill in Mesiga, he will bring his wife and child to live there. And when he does this, you call him because he will tell you the way. So he said, what is the way? So my father told him, this is the way. Abuweni's sister and then Abuweni and the chief all repented. And then the whole village, the whole area. And so as he led them in beginning to know their walk with Christ and to know him, there came a time when he said, now, all of the family shrines, all of the family altars, all of the jujus, all of the anklets, and all of these things you have, we have to destroy them. Because if you're following the true God, there can be no other God but Jehovah. So they made the day, and he came, and they had gathered those things in a huge pile. And I can vision it. I was not yet born, but I can see it because I have done the same thing in other villages myself. But as they were there and they made this huge pile of all of these family shrines and all of these things, they poured the fuel on them. The old chief came to my father. He said, but there's one thing I need to ask you about. There's this other altar that we only sacrifice to it when there's drought. No other time. Only when there's no rain. That's the only time we will make sacrifices. And when we do, the rain will come. So my father said, okay, show it to me. And he told me he had looked like a log about this long, looked like wood, it was very, very hard. So he said, yes, that needs to be included. So they took it and they added it. Then they renounced those things. They prayed over it. They lit the fire. Everything burned. When all of the fire was done, that thing was still there, untouched. They tried to burn it. They couldn't. They tried to burn it. They couldn't. They tried to break it into pieces. They couldn't break it. Nothing would cause it to break. They could not. And while they were trying to break it apart, he said suddenly, they noticed that from the southwest, there was, there were, like this was in the height of dry season. And yet they saw these rain clouds gathering in the southwest. Now in that place, the rains always come from the northeast first. But here the rain clouds are gathering in the southwest. And when those first rains come up there, they always come with winds, winds that will take roofs off of houses, strong winds. Those first rains are always violent, and winds and rain, storms. They realized this storm was coming from the southwest, but it came quickly. So everybody didn't know, the whole crowd, they didn't know what to do. The chief's receiving room it was a big round room, huge, with one pole in the center. And on one side, he kept his horses. On the other side, the chief sat on his skins and on a raised platform. So everybody rushed in. 
My father said they were all inside. He said no one could even sit down. It was just standing. Everybody's packed inside tight because the wind was raging outside. And he said suddenly there was this lightning that struck that pole at the top. That lightning struck the pole, and he said he could see the lightning traveling down the pole in the center of that room. And it came down almost to the heads of the people. Then that lightning went from there, and it went straight out the door to that place and consumed that altar. Destroyed it, consumed it. Something that you can look at and see. That was somewhere in 1939, early 1939. Abba Winnie, that chief's son who was converted on that day, became the Assemblies of God apostle to that region. And I was going to the village where he was pastoring in 19, probably 83, maybe 82, probably 83. So how, that's 20, 20 some years later. I had a four-wheel drive vehicle. And I'm going through, and it was drought. That time in Ghana, if you were in Ghana in 1983, you remember that there was great drought. There was hunger. There was a great deal of hunger, even in Accra. You remember when these bones would show here, everybody called them Rawlings Chain? It was a difficult time. My wife and I, you will not recognize the photos of us then and now. I came up around that, and I was coming up on that hill. All the crops were dying. You could see where the corn had come up about so many inches and fallen over in the field. Everywhere I had gone, all the crops were dying in the fields. I came up just to this valley where Abimwini was pastoring. The church was in the center. As I came up over that, it was green every place. Green every place, around the church, around the parsonage. The whole valley was green. The guinea corn, the corn, everything was growing and thriving. And in those years of hunger, they were feeding their neighbors. You see, they had to destroy the thing in their life. They thought, well, this is something we just can't destroy it because if the rain doesn't come, we can't live. They were obedient and they destroyed that thing in their life that they just knew they had to have. But God never abandoned them. All that many years later, he's still supplying in the midst of famine, in the midst of drought. Do not, do not ever underestimate what God will do when he puts something like this into your heart, when he leads you to a place, when there's something you say, but God, I can't give that up. I can't forgive that person. I cannot this, I cannot that. God says, if you obey me, I will do what you need to do. Spend your time with scripture. Spend your time with the spirit. Come to the table for the sacraments. Go out and serve him and he will go before you. Let your roots grow deep, deep, deep into the soil of the word of God and the spirit so that you have the power to stand and you have the means to accomplish that. Father, I thank you for your people that are gathered here today. I praise you for these people that are gathered. I thank you for their obedience to you and being here, for this pastor, his wife, the other staff of the church, the elders of the church, all that are gathered here, I pray a special blessing on them 
I pray, Lord, that you will release your Holy Spirit upon them today. Lord, let there be a release of your Holy Spirit that will bring them to a new place of walking with you, a new place of seeing your presence in their midst, empowering them, guarding them, keeping them, watching over them, that no evil will befall them, that everyone who steps through these doors will know they've walked into a house of peace, a house of blessing, and a house where there is love that will transform their lives. We thank you for transformation. We thank you for transformation for this entire community. We thank you that this is a place of transformation. This is a place where God can use those who gather here to bring transformation around them. We thank you for this, Father, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. What do we say to the man of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Brethren, it is, it is a good testimony, a good testament to see the sacrifices that others made so that they could send the word of God to us in Africa. Hallelujah. It's, it's unfortunate that there's nobody from Boku and Walwale. Um, here, uh, but so that you could respond to the language. But from there, the word of God came down uh, through assemblies of God to the, uh, to the south, that where anybody who has been ministered to by assemblies of God, they were the pioneers from village to village, and God showed up every time in their life. But you know what? We serve the same God. Hallelujah. We serve the same God. And today, our God might not be that small little rock or, or wood. But our God that we serve today might be our time. Hallelujah. That God wants us to give to him. Might be, uh, might be our resources, our money. That we think that we should get everything. And in doing so, forget our God. Hallelujah. Amen. The word of God has come. Please, shall we all be outstanding? I mean, I want you to give a response. The same God, the same God, the same God. If we will, if we will be with him in his word. And allow his spirit to lead us and interpret. And if we prepare even for the sacraments and serve God. Forgetting everything and serve God. God will lead us. It doesn't matter the drought of the world. It doesn't matter the difficulties. He himself has the ability to make our field green in the midst of the drought. The gods that cannot be destroyed. God himself will send fire to destroy it. You, we just have to obey him. We just have to walk, sit with him, learn, walk with him so that we can stand with God and see his glory. Pray. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to commit to God. Yes, the word of God has come. Boko. But it has come with power. And we've heard it. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word this morning. Your supernatural, Lord Jesus, is still with us. Father, therefore, we ask in the name of Jesus, let that same fire. 
Father, Lord God, that came through the lightning, Lord Jesus, your fire, fire from heaven. Father, Lord God, come upon this church in the name of Jesus. That everything is that is not of you. Father, Lord God, we burn it in Jesus' name. But Lord God, we take of your blood, the blood of Jesus. Father, Lord God, and we drink of your blood. Father, Lord Jesus, and we take your cross, almighty God. And we declare that there's no other power but you, Lord Jesus. You alone will depend on. You alone, Lord God, will trust. You alone we will serve. You alone, Lord Jesus, will have communion with. You alone, Lord Jesus, will develop a relationship with. You alone, you alone, you alone, you alone. Let everything, Lord God, that is not of you bear. The Lord God, your name, and your name alone will be glorified. This, Lord God, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. If the men and women of God will come around and let us bless the communion. Amen. Bishop.